So just a little bit about me. Um, I'm Hurdy. Um, I'm a software engineer at one of the banks here. Uh, currently working in Scala and Kotlin, obviously. Uh, have other interests in other languages like Elixir and Elm, so I'm still dabbling in it. Um, I also like to uh, maintain this. Uh, I'm currently maintaining uh, a couple of open source projects. Um, also busy organizing uh, Scala meetups uh, and also doing some volunteer work with uh, Nginx SG. You can find me in the internet, uh, Twitter, GitHub, and I also have a uh, website. So <laughs> not much in there though. Um, so sometimes I think it's a little bit hard to sort of explain why we're doing what we're doing. So I want to start this presentation with a little bit of information about why Scala and Kotlin. So the idea for this presentation is not to actually compare. Uh, it's not going to be a language war, you know, which one is better. But it's just that to give you a bit of information about why we chose both for our current project. So, you know, as the story goes, the business said, you know, they want to roll out this product globally. So they come up with a new, basically, requirements. Uh, and as engineers, we have to do our best to actually basically deliver what the business wants. So, you know, sometimes it's a small thing, uh, but in our case, it's actually not quite a small thing. So they come up uh, with, uh, I guess, the direction that we're moving from what was uh, predominantly a batch uh, batch oriented uh, process sorry product now they're wanting to turn it into uh, more of a real time product so there are a few challenges though you know which such a big shift uh, one of the biggest uh, is the amount of the technical debt that we've i guess sort of uh, accumulated. So the existing product is actually written in Java 7, Java 7 code, and Java 7 runtime. And if you know, uh, if you've worked in a bank before, you know how hard it is to actually get that uh, updated to Java 8. So, but, you know, uh, when I joined, one of the first mandates that was given is that, okay, so we have this product, so we want to see if we can uh, come up with a nice new improved algorithm. So we decided to write in Scala. Of course, things never really went to plan, so they decided, okay, we want to accelerate this. So it's like, what? Okay. So, you know, we're going to be uh, delivering this new product in uh, quite a tight deadline, but at the same time, we want to improve the developer experience. So a lot of the boilerplate code we want to basically remove just trying to be able to concentrate on business logic and flow and of data. Also, you know, right now uh, the code uh, is not in the best shape, so it's actually quite hard to test. So we want to make it easier as well as we go along and refactor these things. Of course, the Java 7 problem. So right now it's running on WebSphere uh, application server on Java 7. But, you know, because cloud is the way to go these days, so we want to support it on uh, Docker and Kubernetes. So that's one of the challenges as well. So basically, this is what I feel like doing. You know, you have a car running and you're trying to change the wheels while it's running. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with this scenario. But why Kotlin? So we have the Scala code, but why Kotlin? So purely subjective reason, because I've used it before. It's all right, so, but other more objective reason is because they have good Java 7 support. So starting from Kotlin 1, they do support uh, Java 7 as a target, like Scala as well. So Scala 2.11 does compile to Java 7, sorry, Java 6 compatible, compatible bytecode. But at the same time, it has more, oh, sorry, Kotlin has modern language features, uh, good collection libraries, which doesn't require you to upgrade to Java 8. And this is one of the key features of it was uh, is two-way interop uh, with Java code. Some other reason is basically Google's endorsed it for Android development, so we know it's not going to go away anytime soon. Well, I hope, unless Oracle has different ideas. 
So I'll go into a little bit more detail uh, why Kotlin and Scala, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna give a little bit of an overview on how those two languages are actually quite similar and how they are different in some respects. So if you look at this piece of code, pizza. oh, pizza's here. <laughs> um, basically, it's hard to tell which one is Kotlin, which one is Scala, because they are the same. Sometimes if I open up IntelliJ, go to a file, takes me about one or two seconds to figure out, you know, what the hell exactly I'm writing here. Is this Kotlin or Scala? So, of course, I'm exaggerating, but for this simple uh, variables, val and var, it's kind of like has similar concept in Kotlin and Scala. So once you assign to val, you can't uh, assign any more. Uh, again, same with var. Kotlin also has the concept of uh, case classes, or in this instance, they call it the data classes. The only difference being that it's called data classes, and it also has a val uh, in front of it. So to, um, I guess, um, as a um, access, well, to show that it's actually a public uh, property. So, um, but however, unlike Scala's, they actually generate the getter and setter uh, automatically. So again, back to the Java 7, oh sorry, Java two-way interrupt. When you see this, uh, when you try to uh, use this class in Java, basically the signature is what you would expect in Java code. So you get user.getName, user.setName, and so on. Um, string interpolation, kind of like similar, mostly. Uh, Except in Kotlin, anything with a double quote, basically you can just append a, uh, put a dollar in and it's string interpolation. Multiline is kind of similar as well, so you can uh, use margin and strip it. So in all honesty, I can't remember which one is which because I didn't actually look at the document, but just try uh, one of them. It'll work in one of the language. Vice versa. Vice, oh, it's the other way around, isn't it? See? See? So, <laughs> all right. I just written this one to be able to Ah, okay. Great. Some other small features. Lazy delegates, quite easy to do in Scala, lazy val. And Kotlin is by lazy. And of course, we also have companion objects, so where we put all our static stuff in. So in Scala, you could uh, define it uh, at the same level. In Kotlin, it's actually part of the object, so you define it as companion object. Um, just, uh, actually I forgot what I was gonna say, but just talking a little bit about constant that in Kotlin, uh, they have a, a specific keyword for constant. Um, and on this example as well, um, that Scala uses def for uh, methods, uh, but Kotlin uses run. Actually, this is not valid Kotlin code because it doesn't have the um, brackets. Sorry, does, does it mean that it can't have a, a standalone object? Uh, you can have object, actually, yes. But this is just the way, uh, well, yeah, you have class and you have objects, you have data class. But uh, this, actually, yeah, that's also one of the other similarities as well. But in order to uh, create companion objects, this is how you do it in Kotlin. Um, uh, Kotlin objects are lazy like Scala? Uh, I don't believe so. No, I don't actually use it that often. Mostly we use data classes and class, but yeah. Um, they also have deconstruction. So um, in this example, I'm actually giving a tuple, uh, which is quite easy to construct in Scala. One caveat in Kotlin is that they only provide pair and triple. Anything else, you have to build your own data structure. But any data structure, data class that you build, is actually, you can deconstruct like tuple. So you, get, you can actually just extract it, just uh, A, B, C, D, E. And type alias. Now, this is probably a, quite a trivial feature, but um, you know, sometimes when working in, a, um, I guess, a, like a complex code base, you wanna give different meanings to say, um, I guess, primitives. So sometimes we wanna, you know, 
define a money as amount, but you don't really want to uh, create a new class for it. Um, so as in Scala, uh, you know, at compile time, it's just going to uh, basically uh, fall back to uh, the, I guess, the original type. So that's, I guess, some of the stuff that is actually quite, uh, well, almost the same. Now, there are a little bit of differences as well in Kotlin. So one of the key things here are nullable values. So in Scala, you know, you can still define something and then assign a null to it. But in Kotlin, they actually do enforce it at the compiler level. So if you define a local date, uh, sorry, OK, let me take a step back. So just to give a quick explanation, whenever you see a question mark after a type in Kotlin, that means it's actually a nullable type which means that you know, the value could be either that or no. Um, and, uh, but however, in Scala, you have the option type. But the thing is, like in option type, you can actually assign null to it as well. So in this regard, when dealing with Java code, uh, it's actually a little bit better. Uh, one annoying thing, though, when you're actually using Java libraries, anything that comes to Java you'd see in the API docs comes with an exclamation mark, excla uh, exclamation mark meaning that don't trust this code. You know, you got to make sure it's, you know, not now. But within the context of Kotlin, uh, whenever you define your types, you have nullable types, uh, it will force you to deal with nullability. So uh, I'm giving you uh, uh, an example of uh, a lat, um operation, which is kind of like a map for option types in Scala. So this is uh, sort of like a magic, um, what would you call it, method. Because it works for any data type. So in this example, uh, what I'm doing here is a date that might be null. If it's not null, then I'm actually uh, getting the value of that and then getting the day of month. So this day can either be uh, the day of the month or now. Same in Scala. So at the end, you would either get uh, a sum of the day of month or none. So one particular, I guess, drawbacks of this is that, um, well, when dealing with uh, this nullability in Kotlin, when you actually put a uh, nullable Java value, uh, is this uh, actually doesn't, uh, wait, sorry, let me track back. So today, local date, now, today. Oh. Ah, yeah, so when you have a value and you put a nullable value, it's okay, whereas uh, in Scala, you actually have to wrap it in option type. So sometimes when you're actually uh, dealing with Java code, you have to be really careful about you know, whether it's actually uh, null or not. A uh, quick question, does the code link um, have, have the flat map for map method? Yes, but flat map is not, uh, no, uh, for if you have uh, a value, uh, sorry, an array which might have a value or null, you do uh, map not, map not null, which will remove all nulls. Filter not null, map not null. It's one of those. So uh, flat map doesn't work uh, like in Scala where you actually iterate over. Um, no, actually, go none option. It's okay. We can check. The yeah. yeah, yeah. But yeah, <laughs> um, one of the other good things uh, that I like in Kotlin, it's actually easy to provide extension methods. So in Scala, you have to jump the hoops by providing an implicit class and then bring that implicit into scope uh, in order to provide additional functionality to an existing class. Whereas in Kotlin, you basically just start typing the type dot whatever method you want and then it'll provide you. So as long as it's in important in scope, you can build a lot of these existing like um, extension methods. 
So you know, um, and this particular example, uh, I extend result set from JDBC. Uh, of course, this is just an arbitrary example, but uh, normally um, you have to, um, in Java, it's very hard to do. You have to wrap it over, but uh, in Sky. Um, one other difference in Kotlin and Scala. Uh, in Scala, basically, square bracket, uh, sorry, curly brackets, you, you know, just um, create a new expression block. In Kotlin, you have to use slap. So that's the magic uh, right there. Um, now, one other difference between Kotlin and Scala as well is that, like Scala, you implicitly returns the last uh, item on the, oh, sorry, the last value on the block. In Kotlin, uh, it does require you to do, uh, use return unless you use this. So um, in our project, uh, we sort of um, you know, settled on this uh, LAT convention just so we can keep that sort of like idioms similar with Kotlin and Scala. Uh, one other, uh, I guess, similarities uh, when, you know, Creating ADTs in Scala, it would be a sealed trait. Uh, you'd have case class, case object. Uh, in Kotlin, it would be a sealed class, um, and you can have a data class or uh, object that it extends from. It. So the good thing is that in both languages, uh, if you do pattern matching against ADT in Scala, it'll provide provide exhaustiveness. In Kotlin, it will do the same. So unless you specify, uh, sorry, explicitly handle that case the compiler will complain. Also something similar uh, in the collection libraries, so they, have, they do provide similar um, uh, methods. So you have the map operations um, filter. Uh, you can take the, I guess, the element uh, at the beginning, head or first. Support for deconstruction uh, in Scala it's, uh, and Kotlin, it's quite uh, similar. So, uh, one thing uh, in Kotlin uh, is that uh, they don't use underscore. Uh, they do use this sort of magic word uh, called it. So every time you don't actually define, uh, I guess, or assign a name, you refer to it as it. And pattern matching. So you know you have ADTs. You can pattern match it. So if you don't provide or you don't handle all cases or scenarios, the compiler will complain. Um, however, this is one of big, the big drawbacks of Kotlin is that the pattern matching uh, is, um, I guess, not as nice as Scala. So they don't do uh, deep uh, deconstruction. Um, it's very, uh, very, it's, I guess in my view, it's just a little bit better of the normal switch statements. Uh, one thing that is quite different from Java switch is that whenever you uh, check for type uh, inside this block is basically casted to that type automatically. So when you're dealing with um, ADTs, uh, if it's a BMW, then you can actually uh, basically just get uh, the series property So as I mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, getter and setters makes working uh, with Kotlin code from Java relatively easy. Uh, you know, you probably won't realize that it's actually Kotlin code. Um, just on this point as well, um, before we decide, rather before I decided to move to Kotlin, uh, we, uh, I, you know, we we sort of continued down the Java seven. Um, code so we you know until I got tired of writing code you know too much to write uh, we also use Lombok so if you're uh, not in a position to move to Kotlin or Scala you know Lombok provides some of this nice feature uh, although in saying that they don't really work well in one project uh, obviously when you have Java code and Kotlin code some of those uh, well because in Lombok you define the uh, properties uh, just as private field, uh, fields, and you can't access the getter setter. You actually have to uh, 
create them in separate modules in order to access them. So one of the, um, I guess, difference as well is uh, in Kotlin, you actually uh, need to use this uh, no argument plugin in order to keep the existing Java convention. Because otherwise, when you have a data class, you actually have to uh, construct it with all the arguments supplied. So only with this uh, that you can actually uh, basically uh, instantiate this uh, object in the Java way. Uh, well, in a way, yeah. So you have to, I guess, you know, it's a, a choice. So, <laughs> but it is quite helpful, especially when dealing with, uh, I guess, migration projects, because you don't have to change everything at the same time. So this is exactly what we've done. So, you know, we had the old Java 7 code with this style. And then once we, um, I guess, the code is in a nicer shape, we remove the plugin. And then that's just a matter of actually converting. Are you hoping if it was doing something magical? Oh, no, no. No, unfortunately not. Oh, you can. I think it's just now. Uh, I can't, I, I don't know. Actually, I haven't tried it. So I didn't try to intentionally break my system, but we'll <laughs> try that. Um, good question. I think um code the yeah, you have to initialize with all the arguments uh, with the so properties you initialized. Use plugin, then you the code to use the new constructor, <coughs> and then you take the plugin. Yep. So uh, yeah. Concept. Yep. Exactly. So um, also the other um, useful plugin is the all open plugin, uh, especially useful when you actually use Spring, because Spring uh, doesn't like if you have a lot of like uh, final uh, classes. Uh, it complains that uh, can't proxy this, can't proxy that. So uh, yeah. Uh, there is a plugin called Kotlin Spring um, to alleviate this. So um, the other way is, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, when talking about overloaded constructors, um, this is one way that uh, it helps to do interop uh, with uh, Java code. Uh, so when you actually uh, have a class with um, property with a default value, uh, if you don't use this, uh, basically it doesn't generate that sort of like uh, overloaded uh, constructor method. You simply add this annotation and magic. It's not the same with functions. Functions, uh, I think it does it automatically. Only in this uh, constructor overloads. Um, the other thing as well, static methods and fields. Um, Yes, you can uh, basically create them so in the companion object, but without the JVM static, uh, when you try to access this uh, fields or function, you actually have to access the companion object first. So it would be user.companion, then whatever it is. So with static, you actually sort of like uh, converting it to a more Java way. Um, one of the interesting things that Kotlin has, which I wish Scala had, is this thing, supply run uh, and also. Um, so what it does is this thing is really useful to actually make uh, working with Java libraries really pleasant. So it's actually quite uh, helpful in terms of ergonomics. So I know like uh, sometimes you've seen those uh, when you instantiate a class with Java, you go, you know, new class and then class set this, set that. So with Kotlin, you can uh, do the method apply. And implicitly, it's just going to return this at the end. So with run, um, it's a little bit different where it actually returns the result. And one other thing as well is also, so you normally use it to perform some sort of side effect, but it will actually return the callable uh, value. 
So it's really useful, especially with uh, some of the Java libraries just assume that you want to mutate that object. You just use apply. So you know, do this for it, and then you'll get the updated object. I wish we had this in Scala. So this object is not uh, unmutable. It's mutable. Uh, this object, uh, yes. So uh, I know I'm keep reusing the same example, but yeah, in this instance, the uh, name is actually var, h var, and then this would be something like a persistence that returns a persistent state of that object. So um, yeah, so very useful when dealing with Java code. Uh, you don't necessarily want to apply this in Kotlin code, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> One other nice thing is obviously when dealing with the denialable values is at the end of the expression, you still have a null, you can actually um, provide a default value. In this instance, I'm just drawing an illegal argument exception. So, I mean, that's probably the main part of the talk. So I just want to sort of like close this talk with a bit of retrospective. So I haven't really touched on uh, about some of the toolings that we used to actually get this thing working and glued together. So one of the things that I would like to highlight is that Gradle actually helps a lot. Um, we had a choice of actually going with Maven or Gradle ended up using Gradle and I don't regret it. Um, so no XML, it's concise syntax, and it's scriptable. Basically, it's groovy. What is Kotlin's preferred build tool? Does it have like an SPT-like thing that I know you? Oh, like the, oh, actually, yeah. I mean, it, I think they, they're just trying to uh, have a level playing field between Maven and Gradle. I think for all of their plugins, they have both Maven and Gradle. But just, oh, sorry, you have a question, Adam? Oh, no, okay. So, yeah, the uh, reason why I went with Gradle is because of the scriptability. Uh, our project uh, isn't exactly a typical one. So I'm actually leaning on all this uh, scriptable scripting functionality in Gradle to actually uh, get that uh, sort of like working together nice. So just to give a bit of context, before I started on the... Um, this whole project, uh, the only way to actually compile and package a project is through Eclipse. So it it's took us a long way and actually to you know, get this into a, a sort of like an automated uh, build deploy package state. So I don't know how I can do it without Gradle. Ah, yes. So they provide the, yes, uh, the language. I think they switching from uh, Groovy to Kotlin, which is awesome. Uh, and yeah, of course, it supports Scala, Kotlin, and Java in one project. The only caveat is that um, you cannot, well, the thing is with the Scala plugin, uh, it always compiles last. So you cannot refer to Scala classes or Scala methods uh, from Java or Kotlin code. So you actually have to extract it to a separate module, and then you figure out how these things depend on each other. So you build some sort of like a nice graph. So, which is quite exciting. But, you know, the process, you get parallel execution. So we're using Gradle 4.7, and it's nice when you do Gradle W compile, you see it spins up like eight demons and compiling uh, everything all at the same time. It's like, yes. You know, people complain that, oh, Scala compiling is slow, but if you're doing it, compiling like, you know, eight modules all at the same time, it doesn't really matter. So anyways, I talked about Lombok. We use the data annotation to sort of like create that automatic getter and setter. Uh, for logging, this is pretty useful. Uh, we use uh, type safe logging and also uh, k logging, which provides some similar functionality. So it automatically uh, uh, provides you with a one thing that uh, we're trying to sort of enforce is that all our tests is going to be in Scala. So I think that's one of the good things that uh, all the testing um, ecosystem is a lot more mature. Uh, and, you know, this is the first time I'm actually running uh, Scala with a genetic unit test runner. I didn't even know it actually works out of the box. So that was great. So, you know, with Spring, 
um, you know, you only have to provide um, a little bit of code to uh, give it uh, a bit of like the, the sort of like a context management uh, feature, but then it will just work. And of course, Gatling as well, it's been quite indispensable and it's written in Scala. So anyone knows what Gatling is? Anyone use JMeter? JMeter. Yes, that's better. No. <laughs> No, I'm just joking. No, but uh, because it's written in Scala, so um, you know it's kind of like uh, you know all this Scala ecosystem and the testing environment is sort of like nice and cohesive. So comes to, I guess, the point. Throughout the presentation, you know, I've sort of talked about the similarities. So it seems like there's actually quite a big overlap. So you know, when would you use Scala? When would you use Kotlin? I mean. For me, personally, I would probably fall to Scala for any new projects, uh, but just for this particular one, because we have a lot of sort of like a code uh, that we actually need, or older, sorry, Java 7 code that we need to work with, so Kotlin kind of makes sense. Um, so the title of the Java++ now falls to Kotlin. Uh, I guess we can call Scala the Haskell minus minus now. Um, <laughs> So a lot of overlap, but it's still lacking in a lot of respect, and I don't think you know that's where they want to go anyway. Um, Kotlin uh, still uses a lot of the facilities from Java um, unchanged, so you know we do find issues with, or not exactly issues, but annoyances like type erasures uh, and having to do casting, and you just litter your code with suppress here there, so just to get off those annoying messages. So, but you know if you're still in Java, uh, can't move to Scala for whatever reason, you know, this is probably uh, a good bet. So some of the lessons learned, uh, we use mostly Kotlin code in uh, the core or common module because we need to preserve that sort of like intro between uh, Java and Scala code and Kotlin code as well uh, until such time that most of it are scala -ified. I guess. So like what I mentioned as well, we basically break down um, our project into a lot of modules, provide hard boundaries, um, but the benefit is that the build is heavily parallelized. Now, it's not really fun actually having these three languages in a project. Anyone can tell you that, uh, especially with, uh, you know, I guess the build um, order Sometimes you start writing IntelliJ is smart enough to recognize, oh, you're trying to reference the Scala code from this module. But when you run the compiler, they say, no, no, I can't find this, fix it. Scala type conversions, yes, implicits everywhere. Um, so unfortunately, it's, um, well, it is quite unfortunate that we had to deal with Java Big Decimal. So we had to do a lot of conversion, Java list as well. Oh, the good thing about Kotlin is that all this sort of like uh, collection method just works on normal um, Java types. So that's a good thing. And of course, you know, if you think that writing in Scala can be done in many different ways, well, same problem you're going to meet with Kotlin. You know, it provides that kind of flexibility as well. But most of all, you know, trying to get this thing sort of like um, cohesive, there's a lot of orchestration between all the different team members. So, you know, had to agree on, you know, what approach we take, syntax, code styles, and basically what are we gonna do in the long term. So we agree that, you know, Scala is the way to go. So, but in the meantime, you know, uh, we'll use Scotland. So what's next? So, um, you know, this is, still me pondering about uh, where we're gonna take the code. Obviously one of the things is that, uh, you know, I think everywhere. Oh, let me start first. So, um, you know, whether it actually makes sense to bring some of this sort of like functional programming idioms to Kotlin. Is there any value to it? Oh, I mentioned uh, arrow library. Um, 
it's basically just a greater dependency way but provides us with this types uh, option types try either and uh, all those things that are common in the uh, Scala standard library so maybe need to spike on it a little bit and also uh, once we move to uh, asynchronous code um, how are we gonna bridge this gap within the Scala futures or uh, and within Kotlin coroutines does it make sense I don't know uh, we'll see and the other thing as well is you know because of this sort of like uh, I guess two different language three different languages especially for Scala you have to do a lot of conversions you know how much cost are we incurring here so of course for end-to-end -end, we do have Gatling um, one of the tools I've used before was a Scala meter again you know mature testing libraries in Scala so with Scala meter it's actually sort of like a macro benchmarking library so you can actually um, uh, you know basically bench your uh, method execution time it does warm-ups and then basically bunch uh, crops a bunch of stats for you to look at including memory consumption and things like that so but we haven't done that yet so maybe soon I hope and that's it I, uh, anyone have any questions so you're, you're using Kotlin now for the Java 7 interop. Yep. So you're on the Java 7. Yep. Maybe yep. Is, how much interop are you, are you using, are you doing with actual like Java code? Are you, yeah. are you calling Java code from Kotlin? Like, and you're, you're pretty much leaving that untouched? As, yeah. Or what, how, how does that? Okay. Um, the thing is, because the uh, I guess the, the particular code base is uh, a little bit uh, tricky to we can't basically we can't do migration all at the same time. So what we're gonna do is actually refactor, um, I guess, portion of the code into um, I guess a function and then move that over to Kotlin. Something along the line of that. So you still need to call the new code from uh, the old Java code. So. I mean, you can sort of do it in Scala, but um, it actually is a little bit harder. And sometimes, like, it doesn't, um, the method signatures doesn't quite, uh, I the, guess. Okay, so collections are a bit harder. What else? The collections? Collections between Scala and Java. Ah. Uh, Converting collections. Yep, yep. Um, of course, I mean, all the other stuff are sort of like vanity because you're dealing with uh, the Kotlin data classes it's not as nice as using it in, in Scala uh, because you don't have the apply and apply and then you don't, you know, like the, um, I guess, what okay, else? Yeah. What, what I'm getting at is, is okay, so it's, it's transitional now. Yep. But what happens when the entire code base is all Kotlin and at some point you get approval for, to run Java 8, Java 9? Oh, actually, uh, yeah, about, yeah. Well, so. And then, so now you have a code base of Kotlin and Scala. The syntax is relatively similar. Yep. What, would you keep Kotlin around? Is there a case for it? Yeah, so one use case uh, that I think is valid is actually at the edge, which is the web application framework, because uh, that's, we, we're relying on a couple of, uh, I guess, important, like, well, we use Spring, Spring Web, mm -hmm. and there's also a, a library uh, to, generate JSON uh, API spec um, responses. Mm -hmm. So those, uh, the mature ones on, is only available in Java library. So that's where it makes sense for us to, you know, keep it in Kotlin. But for everything else, we're hoping that, you know, we're actually just going to use Scala for that. Yeah. So again, yeah, the only use cases for me personally is when you actually have to really deal with Java libraries and Java code. One comment oh. also about the type conversion. Uh, we also use Scala in our so called the domain domain model. Yep. And, uh, we use Java and the uh, web layer. So we realized that it is actually a lot simpler and at the same time a lot more powerful if you just use the, the Scala data types in yep. the Java project. And because Jackson anyway can convert seamlessly ah. the Scala objects back to JSON. Okay. Okay, no, that's actually an interesting uh, comment. No, I have a look into that. Yeah. Using Java code is like a like powerful collections library. Yep. Okay, I'll have to 
I'll have to seriously uh, spike on that. <laughs> cool, thanks for that. Uh, any other question or comments? No more? Well, okay. oh, yes. How much people in your team do Scala and how much people use Scotland? Okay, no one used, oh, no one used Scotland before except me. So mm -hmm. in the beginning, it was sort of like a unilateral decision. Uh, but I think um, it was because we had this sort of constraint. So, you know, we could keep it in Java 7 code. But then, obviously, you know, we don't really get that sort of like, um, uh, how do you say, like, the code is not as easy to understand as if you were writing it sort of like the Kotlin or Scala idiomatic way. So, but uh, in terms of Scala, uh, some of the people in the team have, have, have had Scala background. And uh, of course, you know, when they move into Kotlin code is, you know, uh, not that hard because some of the, I guess, syntax are quite similar, except that, you know, some of the things that we can do in Scala, we can't really do it in Kotlin. So that is kind of frustrating. So, but Good thing is that the Kotlin standard library documentation is quite comprehensive. So sometimes we can actually just figure out a way how to, you know, do a similar thing in Kotlin. So, so if I understand this correctly, Kotlin is actually the second rewrite of this uh, of the code base. No, so um, what happened is that uh, we uh, started uh, to spike on this new algorithm in Scala. But at the same, at the same time, uh, we need to bring this older code base uh, and basically the two has to meet together. So because the uh, code base is already running in production, so we can't easily write them all in Scala all at one go. So we're choosing to the sort of like f uh, migration, you know, step by step. So, you know, just take bits of his, uh, convert it into uh, Kotlin. Some of the core stuff that don't depend on the existing uh, code base can be written in Scala. So it's kind of like a, a bridge. Oh, sure. Uh, yeah, follow up for the, for the team thing. So do you have like a group that does this algorithm spiking in Scala? Or does and other people have to work with putting it into the existing system? Or does everyone have to now work in all three languages? Um, so most, pe oh, most of us in the team don't have to deal with the Java 7 code. But uh, definitely people who actually deals with uh, the new code base will work in Kotlin and Java, sorry, Kotlin and Scala. So like, you know, we provide sort of like uh, help in terms of pair programming. Uh, and also we, uh, I guess, uh, help them in code reviews as well. I know it's not going to be easy. And uh, the, the other challenge is that, uh, you know, of course, we are kind of like uh, distributed amongst teams. So sometimes uh, the only review that we can do is, uh, sorry, the only feedback that we can give is through code reviews. So uh, of course, you know, when you have people coming from Java backgrounds, they move into Kotlin or Scala, they write it in a way comfortable, which is the OOP way. And then we give uh, advice about, okay, you can actually do this way in Kotlin. And most of the time, like, you know, they, they got it our way. Why are we doing what we're doing? Things like, you know, uh, like, you know, those variables have to be immutable because, you know, you don't want to accidentally change the value and things like that. So, and plus some of these collection features, uh, most, you know, uh, are familiar uh, with it through the Java 7 uh, library. So it's less of a big jump than uh, people think it is. So, yep. If you could upgrade to Java 8, 1.8, would you still go with Kotlin? If it was available, you know, I'd probably start using Java 8 streams uh, or, you know, all the collections library. So, at, you know, things were different, I might not uh, even consider Kotlin. So uh, of course, you know, I might still bring the Scala uh, code base because we already had developed it. But yeah, and it's just because okay, you know, we have this runtime that exists. Um, you know, don't know when we can actually upgrade. So we choose this as a, I guess a, an option. Uh, sorry, fallback so mechanism. Kind of related to this question, was uh, using an older version of Scala that could target uh, Java 7 or? Uh, we're using 2.11. That can pass down uh, to. So, so I guess the question would be rather than actually write, rewriting the Java, uh, the, the Java code base in Kotlin, uh, was uh, writing it in, in, in Scala actually an option for you? It would be, uh, but it's, um, I guess one, one of the things about that is the two-way interop uh, isn't as nice. So yeah, I mean, it's easy if you only need to call Java code from Scala, but when you need to do it the other way around, it's, yeah. 
Are you guys using the Arrow library? Arrow? Not at the moment, no. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, that's one of the things to consider, like, you know, would be gain anything from introducing this, you know, option types, try either. Um, is it really necessary at all? So. Okay. Uh, arrow, oh. Yes, Kotlin Arrow. So um, they provide uh, sort of like this functional uh, data types, type classes, and all this other stuff. Niceties that you find from uh, Scala as uh, basically a dependency. So, so is there anything that is not there in Kotlin Scala? At the fundamental level, uh, pattern matching is really lacking in Kotlin. So is there anything like four comprehensions? In Arrow, yes. So, Arrow, but yep, not, 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 not in base column. Yes. Yep. Future? Uh, core routines, I guess, uh, but it's a bit different. Sorry. Wait, uh, <coughs> when, you have a, when you have your final, when you have your code now in, in the future in Kotlin and Scala, how do you intend to migrate everything to Scala? Because oh, n we don't intend to migrate everything to Scala. Most of it, we want to keep it in Scala, only at the, uh, I guess, this key modules which deals with uh, the Spring Web and this JSON API spec library, uh, I think it makes sense to keep it as Kotlin because um, it's just the way the, I guess, the way you use the library. Uh, I'm thinking as you're moving to that phase, do you, do you, do you be in a situation where you have to call Scala code from Kotlin? Would that be oh yeah, we're already doing it now. Oh, so yeah, but um, you know, uh, it's a couple of, you know, Either it's actually a uh, Scala object, uh, so we can actually invoke the method directly, uh, or we enforce uh, interfaces on the common module, and that Scala class in implements that interface. So, because we use Spring, so there's a bit of a DI going on. So, yep. So, is the Spring something legacy that you inherited, or uh, is there a choice to? Kind of, um, not not to use Spring. Well, certainly uh, once we, well, I guess I won't say finish migration, but once we have the code base in a, a good state, then yeah, we, there might be an option to use uh, something other than Spring. But right now it's, you know, because the existing code base uses that, so it doesn't make sense, uh, sorry, yeah. makes sense for us to just completely throw that away and while the core is still in a un unfinished, no, untidy. Yeah, so I guess that was is gonna be the last thing that we we change. And you mentioned Scala tests. Are you writing all of your tests in Scala? In Scala, yes. So we have some tests in basically just the JUnit uh, tests. So we converting into Scala tests. Um, even the Spring um, integration test um, is in Scala test. So, say uh, you have Java engineers and they're uh, used to writing in Java <laughs> manner type yep. that uh, hats. Uh, would you say writing your tests in Scala it would be a good way to introduce Java engineers to Scala? Programs? Yep. So actually, that's one of the first thing that uh, our colleagues done. So uh, they started writing tests uh, in uh, basically Scala tests. So that's also how they actually experiment with uh, the language. Because when you come to the implementation, it's a little bit more trickier. But with tests, you basically just you know invoking method or you know preparing some data and then basically asserting on it. So yes, so they do uh, kind of like a TDD, but also as a learning experience. Have you introduced any functional concepts? Not right now, no. So just a little bit of uh, careful about you know introducing too much too soon. So it's just your mind will melt. Yeah. So we're still using DI, uh, and it's basically just um, you know like the Spring way where you use all the wired inside. So you know, next step is to actually just convert it to a constructor injection, and then next step of that is yeah. So yeah, because the thing is like you know uh, you don't want them to hate the language. So <laughs> just give it a you know bit by bit. So if it's too complex, then they just are you know what is this? Yep. Okay. Cool. Okay. All right. So, all right. Thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed that.